Like she said, I suffocated her. Is it, is it in fact uh, uh, the truth that this tape was sent to the FBI and the FBI deemed this tape inaudible? The FBI would not say what the whispered part was, or they didn't say what it was. And I don't, I don't remember if they classified it as inaudible or not. When we spoke to her yesterday, she mentioned another suspect, a possible uh, officer of the law. Uh, James Glover. There's a lot of contention about Officer Glover. Did you, you, know, you never consider him a no, suspect? There was no evidence that connected him to the crime scene. We knew where he was when the child went missing. There was, there was allegations that he may have actually been stalking Teresa. Were those ever looked into by the DA's office? Yeah, I, we never saw any evidence that he had stalked her. Did you care? I mean, you cared about getting a child killer. That's, that was on your mind? Yeah. All, all I wanted was to know who killed the little girl. I didn't care if it was her or anybody else. At the trial, I called her a monster from hell. It took a monster from hell to do what was done to this child. The evidence presented by the district attorney was pretty convincing. And all of this information put us back to square one. We got a couple more people we have to find and we have to interview them. Once we interview them, the picture will become crystal clear. Right. Right now, we still got a little cloudy. It stopped raining, but it's still cloudy. Reggie and I wanted to talk to James Glover. We had a lead that he was still living in the area. He could right. be within a five to ten mile radius. He, I think he's very close. I think he's very close, but I'm sure he lives. I don't think I don't see him living here. In the city, I see him living out more in the suburbs. Been, Although the DA said Glover had an alibi, we still weren't convinced that it was solid. In the following week, we came across information that cast doubt on that alibi and led us to believe that Teresa's stalking claims might have been true. Teresa's immediate family lives in a small town of Talladega, Alabama, about a five hour drive from Macon. We should find out a couple of things about Teresa's personality. Now, this is, you know, this is the old thing. You, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So let's see what the family is like. I think we'll get a good idea what Teresa is like. This is who she grew up with. At the trial, not one member of Ferguson's family was called to testify. It might have had something to do with a statement her stepsister, Bobby Ann, gave to investigators. She recounted how Teresa told her to wash Taylor's sheets with bleach before the police arrived. Bobby Ann thought this was strange and seemed to indicate that Teresa was acting unusual. What they said I said, that's not what I said. They changed everything I said around. It was misconstrued. Well, what did you say? The sheets was took off the bed, but not the way they say they was took off. That was a damaging statement, really damaging. Mm -hmm. You made it. Did you sign that statement? No, sir. Never I've never signed it? I have never seen that statement. You never saw that statement? I never saw the statement. I, I've never read until Martha gave it to me to read. That's the first time I have read it. Do you think Teresa's capable of ever doing anything like this? No. To nobody think, else, and especially her there's daughter. Not Were you shocked when you heard this, when she was sure. accused of this? Let me tell you, Teresa was one of the best mothers in our family. I mean, I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that. Teresa was a good mother. Better mother than I was, and I thought I was pretty good. I <laughs> You say that Teresa is definitely innocent. You have information, hard evidence that there's someone else involved in this. Uh, that would be James Glover, the police officer. Glover is the same guy that gave Taylor the teddy, the bear. teddy bear five hours before her death. Five hours before her death. Right. Now there was mention of uh, Glover stalking Teresa, right? Oh yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now do you have evidence about that, or can you substantiate that anyway? And the fact that he was there at. Their, her home the next day after Taylor died, and he was not part of the investigation whatsoever. So the day at the car wash, he gives her a teddy bear, and you say the very next day after her murder. Right, he was there when they he searched was there at her the house. home. Right. Is that it? And that may not be considered stalking by a lot of people. You understand that? Mm -hmm. Did you ever see James Wallace? We saw him. Didn't he, know who he was. We didn't know who he was at the time. Um, Tuesday. This is right after the murder. It was mm -hmm. on Tuesday. This guy comes up to the door with a deli tray, sandwich meats and stuff from Kroger. And Martha and I go to the door and he hands it to us and we ask him if he wants to sign the register, who he was and what he was bringing. And he basically just shoved it at us. So what you're saying is the person that bought that tray to the house, that was James Glover? Yes. We know now. We James know now Glover. it was. We, we didn't, didn't know, know then. In, in your minds, who's guilty of this crime? James Glover. James Glover. James Glover. 
Do you see the day when Teresa's going to get out of jail? We're working for the day for her to get out. We won't stop. You won't stop? No. No. We'll never stop. You keep plugging, huh? Teresa was innocent. So that to this family, that's all it needs to be said. She's innocent. We learned a lot from this. Well, I learned that she has a wonderful family, I can tell you that. Yeah. She has a good family. I mean, uh, they didn't say one thing bad about her, the way she raised Taylor. Bobby Ann explained uh, her statement away that she never signed it. That's a good point, that she never signed the statement. One thing I could tell you. What? The gas is cheaper than here than in New York. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> God Beautiful. Almighty. The prosecution presented the jury with three key pieces of forensic evidence. A hair found in Taylor's hand. A blood stain found on Taylor's blanket. And a tire mark found on Taylor's arm. Dr. Joseph Burton was the former medical examiner for Metropolitan Atlanta and the defense's forensic expert. But he was never called to testify. The day they wanted me to testify, I had something else that I was committed to. So what our agreement was was that unless he thought that my actual presence there would make a difference, then I was not going to go testify in person. That's how it came about that I didn't testify. In retrospect, I wished I had gone there. You believe that if you would have testified, you would have put forward some reasonable doubt to the jury? It's possible because, um, you know, you can present the same forensic evidence like the glass that's half full of water. Is it half empty or is it half full of water? You tell the jury there 46 out of 70 some odd hairs that are traumatically pulled that are found on five different items. You don't tell them how many hairs are on which items and how many are traumatically pulled. You don't tell the jury that traumatically pulled can simply mean that I shake my head and uh, a hair falls out or that the average adult loses a hundred hairs a day from their head and body. Unless so you, that percentage didn't mean that much to you? No, did not mean that it much. It's significant. It doesn't tell you who did it. Doesn't tell you where it happened. What about the mother's hair in her hand? Yeah, well, it was one hair. I one hair, right? What about that? What does that mean? Could have been. Could have been the last hair that she went to grasp from somebody. Sure, you could reach out and grab for somebody, and somehow get a hair stuck on your hand. But there's so many other ways that that could happen that unless there's some other evidence to go along with that, that's speculation. Sheer, sheer speculation. The saliva on the blanket. It's a blanket she lives with, basically. Right. Uh, saliva on my pillowcase. <laughs> so, I mean, what does that prove? It proves nothing, because it's a blanket that she uses constantly, according to... C could that have been determined by a lab? No. How old that blood, how old that saliva was on the blanket? You couldn't say it happened an hour ago, a day ago, three days ago. All right, so, so there's a reasonable doubt again. Uh, the other thing uh, that I would have focused on is the tire mark on the arm. The district attorney or the prosecutor were alleging that uh, Ms. Ferguson had placed her by the roadside and in the haste of leaving had run over her arm. Uh, that match to me is the most worrisome thing about all of the evidence. I forget how many number of similar tires just in the state of Georgia that were like this tread pattern. Now, so the, the forensic evidence in this case doesn't stand that it should convict. When you take that tire print away, nothing else collectively or standing alone says that anyone, including Teresa Ferguson, should have been charged with a crime. I have more reasonable doubt to believe now that he's, he's straightened out that thing about the hairs, the blood on the blanket he explained away, a lot of things he explained. The only thing we know for sure, she was alive at 9 o'clock, and at 11.10 she was she found was dead. dead, and that's it. Over the next few days, Reggie and I used some contacts to try to hunt down information on James Glover. All right. The addresses we were getting on him were old news. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Reggie and I felt like we were onto something. We found a few witness statements that were leading us to believe Teresa's story. But we still weren't totally convinced that she was innocent. The more we learned about the death of Taylor Ferguson, the more we wondered what was really going on. First, allegations of a police officer's involvement. And now, new revelations about Teresa's own defense strategy. 
I read through a lot of the documents, and it seemed like there was a lot of reasonable doubt that could have been brought up, but it wasn't, or it wasn't proved to the jury. Maybe uh, the prosecutor made a more passionate case or more dramatic statements. The jury went along and convicted her. The DA told us that one witness saw Teresa coming into the Kroger alone that night. But in the case file, there was another witness that police talked to, a juvenile court judge named McGee, who was also in the store. He testified that he saw a little girl with brown hair wearing clothing that was grayish or light lavender, and he thought the child was dressed strangely. Could he have been referring to the pajamas Taylor was found wearing? His testimony seemed to prove that there was at least one little girl in the store that night. Could it have been Taylor? Then, we tracked down this man, Thomas Kendrick Holmes. Well, I went to Kroger's at about uh, the 10 o'clock, a little bit after 10, and I saw a little girl. She was a small blonde girl, probably around uh, six uh, years old. And uh, she had on a uh, sort of a blouse. It was a uh, flowery uh, blouse. Now, you, let me get this, you were going in to the store, was this like the first passageway, the first door to get into the store? Then you saw this girl coming out the same side that you were entering in? She was coming out it that was same way? that way. She, she had, uh, was, was either fixing to come out or she looked like she might have been going the wrong way. She was just sort of standing there. Standing just there. Just standing there. Alone? Alone. Did the police tell you that they'd be in touch with you? at a later date or the district attorney be calling you anything like that they expressed a, a doubt that if it were that, that that the person that i saw was the uh was a little girl they expressed the doubt that it i was. just assumed that my testimony was not needed and uh and didn't think any more of it now there were two witnesses who say they saw a little girl in the kroger that night but why wasn't holmes asked to testify Thanks. Thank you, sir. Then we found a police report from the night of the murder. A suspicious man had been spotted outside the Kroger supermarket. There was also a report of a man driving by with a child in a white car. According to the police investigation, Glover owned two cars at that time. One was a white Camaro. Hey, Red, I just got from the fax machine. Check this out. We got Oh, the dispatcher sheet. Look how many times they ran the plate, though. Same guy running the plate. Glover yeah. running the plate all those times. That's right. Glover. According to the defense, Glover had run Teresa's license plate numerous times after the murder, giving him Teresa's name and address. It wasn't the proof we were looking for that Glover had been stalking Teresa prior to Taylor's death, but it did seem odd. Just say James. Yellow James. James? Our contacts finally came through with a good address on Glover. Where's 755? Uh-huh. He was living about a half an hour outside of Macon in the neighboring town of Haddock. He's at the top of the hill, right? At the top of the hill. Eleven months after Taylor's murder, Glover resigned from the Macon Police Department after pleading guilty to reporting a false crime. One night, while on patrol, he radioed in that he had stopped to question a suspicious-looking man. Minutes later, Glover called for help, saying he had been shot twice in the chest. At first, he was hailed as a hero, but when his story didn't add up, his own colleagues started asking questions. Glover finally confessed that he made the whole thing up. He had actually taken off his vest, shot it twice, and then put it back on and called for help all in an attempt to impress his estranged wife. You know, to do something like that, you gotta be a little uh, off the wall, to say the least. So a guy like that concerned me, you know, who knows? It's no 